which I call the TCP IP architecture, which is a very ambitious name. It means we will go through the global picture. This covers chapter two of the textbook I mentioned. So the textbook takes the same approach. First gives a total overview, a global overview. More concretely, our goal is to put in place all the things you need to do to do lab zero and to be comfortable with addresses, names, and uh, things of that nature. TCP IP stands, TCP is the name of a protocol, IP is the name of another one. We'll discover them in, in lots of detail uh, a bit later. But the, what it means today is not just those two protocols, but a complete architecture, which is a set of rules, formats, on how to run a network. And one particular uh, way of presenting how it's organized is to view it as what is called a layered way. Layered means the functions that you need to do to have a network uh, operate are classified into different boxes that fit together. That's nothing magical, that's what we do always when we do a complex software system. In this course, we will be talking primarily on the software part of uh, TCP IP. If you do any complex software system, or even a simple one, and there's practically no simple software system, you probably have modules and abstractions and lots of small modules that fit together in containers that make them bigger modules. That's the practice, or the good practice, which is not always followed. That's exactly what happens here in networking with an additional twist. The additional twist is that the different modules that are called application layer, transport layer, network layer, MAC layer, and physical layer, they talk with each other. There is an application layer that talks to another application layer, but also talks to the transport layer. Because in the nature of communication, you don't have one single system, but you have multiple systems. So they are called layers. What we will now describe is what they do. What do those things do? The application layer is the visible part of the internet. That's the collection of all applications that we use. The most popular one, perhaps, is uh, the web. So the web is based on one protocol. So the first term we hear is protocol called HTTP. HTTP means Hypertext Transfer Protocol. When the web was invented, it was with the two ideas. One is hypertext. A so hypertext means a text originally was really text with no graphics. A text on which you can click on some words and when you click on some word there is a link that causes something to happen. Something to happen could be open another page for example. This was called a hypertext and that hasn't existed uh, before the web, in fact before the internet as a way to read documents for example. The second element is that the idea that when you click on something then you have communication with another machine. And this is why we have this, what is called protocol. What is a protocol? A protocol is the formal, these the rules that govern the interaction of two entities that are at the same layer. For example, things that contribute to make the web are typically a web browser. If you connect it to this, you open a web browser window. So you have a web browser here. And that one is talking to a web server. Now, inside the web server, it's talking to an application. And in the web browser, you have an application. Those two applications are at the same level, uh, the same layer. They are in the application layer. When they talk to each other, they have to do it in a well-specified way. By nature of things, if you, do, uh, if you send a message here and this one does not understand, it won't work. Now, when you do a proprietary application, when you do your own application, like we will do in lab three, the rules of the game of the messages can be whatever you have decided makes sense. Hopefully, you have consciously decided about the rules. In the worst case, nobody has decided. You have to read the messages to understand the rules. The idea of the internet is to make those rules official so that someone can do a web browser and someone else can do a web server. 
this set of official rules is called a protocol. So a protocol is a set of rules that govern the interaction between two entities that are at the same layer. The HTTP protocol originally was a very primitive one. It was simply saying uh, you send messages that are called GET, so those three letters in plain text, G-E-T, followed by the file that you want to get. And when this, this machine receives a message, it looks for words like GET, there are a few others like POST, and when it's a GET, it means go into my file system, obtain the file, and send it back to the, uh, the other end. That's a very, very simple protocol. Now, HTTP has become a bit more complicated. It allows to reuse TCP connections and things like this that we will discuss a bit later. That's one application. Other applications are email, uh, lots of uh, other applications you can, uh, you can imagine. But HTTP is still uh, the most popular application. Many applications are themselves built on HTTP. The application layer is not the focus of this course. So it's more the focus of distributed system and information systems. But we will build our own applications in a lab to understand the interaction with the lower layers. The focus of this course is on the lower layer. The next lower layer is the transport layer. The transport layer can be viewed from different viewpoints. But the main way to think of it is, is a standard programming interface. It is the simplest programming interface you have to access the network. Access the network means if you're building an application where A talks to B, then you need to send information. How do you send information from A to B? You could do it in your own way, but typically that's not a good idea because it's better if an operating system does it once for all. And what the internet has defined is a standard way of doing it, which is operating system independent. And that's called the transport layer. So the main goal of the transport layer is to provide to the programmer who programs an application a way of sending and receiving data through the internet, through the network infrastructure. In doing that, there are zillions of ways to do it. And if you read books, a talent bar book on the OSI model of networking, you will find all possible variants. Today, there are two, perhaps three, but the really uh, most important variants are two. They are called TCP and UDP. TCP is the name of a protocol. UDP is the name of a protocol. So in order to provide this programming interface, you still need to define what are the rules that will govern the communication between the end two entities. Those rules are called TCP or UDP. We have a big difference between the two. UDP is unreliable, TCP is reliable. You will tell me why would any care, anybody care doing something that's unreliable. The story is, unfortunately, on the internet, on any network, on any interaction between two physical entities, data can be lost. You try to activate the printer, the data is lost, and the printer does not respond. If this is not caught, your system, your process will hang, in the worst case, will crash in the better case. So data can be lost. Uh, with UDP, if you use UDP, the application has to recover from data loss. The transport layer, if you use UDP, does not attempt to do anything to fix that which may seem like a bad idea. If you are not happy with this bad idea, you use a variant called TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, that will repair all the losses. So it is so-called reliable. It's not really reliable. It's reliable in the sense that if a packet is lost, what can you do if a packet is lost? You code an application, you send a message to a printer, for example, and this message is lost. What can you do? After a certain time, the receiver sends a message to the sender saying, send it again. Yes, although probably you don't want to do it after a certain time. But So you need to acknowledge the data. And once the data is acknowledged, at the source, you're happy. At the source, if you have not received the acknowledgement, you think there is a loss, and you retransmit for that. So if you use UDP and you code your own application, you will need to do this. 
you will need to verify that the data you have sent has arrived. If you use TCP, TCP will do it for you. So if you use TCP, you say send, and then if there is losses, TCP will do everything that is possible to do to repair the losses. Of course, it will only do the things that are possible. For example, if, you're con if you connect to a machine, HTTP uses TCP, so if you connect to a web server, and then the web server hangs or crashes, then you can retransmit whatever you want, it's dead. You cannot, if nobody reboots it, it's dead, it's not possible. <coughs> Similarly, if you break the communication line between you and your next Ethernet switch, you're lost. There's no way, you, by repeating packets, uh, it will be repaired. So TCP will not necessarily make the thing reliable. If it's impossible, it will not be possible. But it will relieve the programmer from doing all the things that need to be done to repair the losses. Why? would someone not always use TCP? Well, as we will see, TCP has some overhead. It's one, complicated to use, and second, it takes some time. Repairing the losses automatically uh, incurs some overhead. Before sending one packet, TCP will send a few packets for you, so it will waste time. Now, some applications are not happy with that. For example, we will see the DNS server in a minute. The DNS server is used to map a name to an IP address. If you have a name, you want to know what's the IP address, you send a query, a short message, to a DNS server. Now, if you send a query to a server, you expect to get a response. So you don't need to code an acknowledgement protocol. If no response comes, then you think there is a loss, and you can repeat your response. So there are simple applications that, by the nature of what they're doing, typically query response applications, don't need to code actively uh, for repetitions. You need to simply re uh, replay the, the question if the response has not come. But you will wait for a response anyhow. You don't need to do some overhead tasks. So those applications typically prefer to use UDP. We will see also that TCP does not work in multicast. So if you're streaming video uh, over like Swisscom does for Swisscom TV, then you cannot do it with TCP. You can do it only with UDP. The application, the, I said that the transport layer provides an application programming interface to the programmer. The, on most systems, i.e. on Linux and on Windows, this is called a socket interface, as we will be able to check uh, a bit later. So we have seen the application layer and the transport layer. The network, the layer below is the network layer. So what is the network layer? Well, the network layer is simply doing this. It's allowing the communication between all machines. So it's about infrastructure. It's about allowing all machines to talk together. Of course, you don't do it in this way. You don't pull cables from all machines to machines. You have one billion hosts on the internet today. Uh, this is not the way it works. The way it works is to use intermediate systems that transport the information. So if A talks to B, then A talks to one machine, this machine talks to another one, and then you build a hierarchy of systems. This is the classical way we have to build very complex systems. In historically, the very first network, so before TCP and IP were invented, so the first versions of the internet before that, were using what is called store and forward. Store and forward means, this is when I was a student at university, you would send a mail to someone. You, in fact, you would send a mail to a machine, which was, I mean, when I was a student on my campus, there was one computer, one for everyone. Right? So all we had we, was a terminal that was simply a display and a keyboard, but the computer itself was in another room a few hundred meters away from that. Then later, when people had PCs, they kept the same structure. So when you would send a message, the message is sent to a computer that analyzes it. Oh, this is a mail for that person. So it will send it to another computer that would eventually send it to another computer, etc. That works for mail. This is how email continues to work today. But this was the way it worked for everything. If you were exchanging data over the internet at that time, the internet or rather protocols, uh, like uh, BitNet, uh, that was of, uh, of, uh, of IBM, then you would use what I can call store and forward. Store and forward means the entire file that you are transferring is stored in all the intermediate 
uh, systems until it reaches the final destination. And then the major invention that was uh, done by TCP and IP was to, so when you were doing store and forward, you, were, you had an application in some sense in all intermediate systems of the internet. The major invention was to say, no, we will use what is called packet switching. Instead of sending the entire information, we have a generic format of information called a packet, and all packets are the units that are interchangeable and can be self-routed. Here is how email works today. If you send a mail uh, from one client to the next, then the mail goes from web server to web server, but whoops, uh, the, uh, the packet that is sent here, will, the mail that was sent here, will be broken in many packets, and the different packets will follow a path of intermediate systems that are called routers. Those are switching systems that look at IP packets, at the address information, and simply forward it to the next router or eventually to the next mail server. So this is the first uh, fundamental uh, idea. I think I have another uh, animation here. No, this animation uh, does not play as it should. We should see many little packets that are broken and uh, follow the path through the internet. Why did people do this? Why do you think it was this first element of evolution? Why is it that if I have a photo to send to you today, or if you download a photo on your Facebook page or from your Dropbox or whatever, the photo will be broken into a large number of IP chunks that are 1,500 bytes at most and will be uh, put together at the destination which seems to be a lot of work for the destination. So why did people come with this weird idea? That was not the very first idea. When people did the first computer networks, they did not do it like this. They said the photo is sent first to an intermediate computer that sends it to another one, etc. Why do we do it like this today? Well, I ask you to guess. We close in five seconds. And the majority thinks it reduces the buffer required in routers. And this is correct. Here is a way to uh, view what happens. This is an important way of think of distributed systems. It's called a time-space diagram. I put on one axis time and on the other space. Of course, it works well if your space is one-dimensional, otherwise it's more difficult to draw. But it's very useful to think. Here's what happens when you do store and forward. And here's what happens at the intermediate message, the intermediate system. The intermediate system needs to store entirely the file, the photo, for example. Whereas when you do packet switching, well, if you're lucky, then you receive one packet, you need to store it, and once you have received this packet, you can send it forward. And if everything happens at the same speed on the left and on the right, then what you need to store at any point in time is one or two packets, as opposed to the entire file. So imagine what that would give if you are downloading not photos but videos, a one gigabyte video, then the intermediate system will need to store uh, lots of gigabytes of video. Of course, you don't want to do this. So that's one of the reasons, it's to reduce the buffering. It does not improve the capacity. In fact, if you want to be optimal from a transmission capacity viewpoint, uh, this is better than that. 
and it does not improve the bit error rate, or it may improve it, but that depends on uh, the type of correction mechanism. But another thing it improves is visible on the vertical axis here, it's also the delay. Here I'm showing only one intermediate system. Imagine you download some things from a server in the US and you might have 20 intermediate systems, then you will take the time to transfer 20 uh, big files, which of course, which may a huge delay. So we can do internet telephony today, for example, because the delays are small and the delays are small because we do packet switching. Here is an example of an IP network that's a stylized, simplified version of the EPFL network. You see things like uh, local area networks, I'll mention in a second what that is, routers, routers are the packet switches, the intermediate systems of the network layer. And then we also see an important part which are the addresses. I mentioned addresses already. In order to participate in the internet, you need an address. It's like if you want to be able to receive mail from the post office, you need a street address. You need a number on your house and a name on your street. If you don't have that, you have to hope the postman knows you personally. Uh, it's similar to the telephone number. In order to receive a call, you need a telephone number. So those are addresses. They are called IP addresses because the internet is governed by what is called the internet protocol. IP stands for internet protocol. And they are called IP version 4 addresses. First uh, thing to know of IP version 4 addresses, this is the classical way of writing them. There are other ways to write them. They are here written as four chunks of digits that represent each a number that is coded on 8 bits. This, therefore, for example, uh, it is something that is between 0 and 255. So an IPv4 address is 32 bits in total. And if you look carefully at those addresses, perhaps you will recognize something. Is there anything that strikes you? Yes, they all, almost all, start with this. Well, this is a prefix that's allocated to EPFL. So we find the first principle that we will go again in the, in the next weeks uh, in detail, that the addresses are structured. The IP address have a structure. Like the postal code, if you have a postal code, uh, if it starts by CH, it means it's in Switzerland. If it starts by CH1000, it means it's in the area of Lake Geneva. Or it's not in Zurich, for example. So there is some topological information in the address. We'll cover that in more detail. You find other addresses on the topmost corner that are a bit different. They're in Zurich, for example, so they are different in nature. There are two types of addresses today. There are IPv4 on the top and IPv6. IPv4 are 32 bits. IPv6 are four times longer, 128 bits. The IPv4 addresses are traditionally written using decimal numbers. The IPv6 addresses are typically, are usually written using hexadecimal numbers. Why did we move from decimal to hexadecimal? Because in 1974, people were not used to hexadecimal. Now we are used to them, so uh, this, and also, so this is why we use that here. So we will come to those addresses a bit later. For now, what we need to know is that those addressing schemes are distinct and incompatible. But worse than that, the network layers that use IPv4 or IPv6 are distinct and incompatible. So if an IPv4 machine speaks to an IPv6 machine, it doesn't work. It's impossible. So we will see how this impossibility problem uh, will be solved. Uh, we will discuss and, and discover in detail and that's perhaps one of the places where the internet failed when they introduced the new version, they made it incompatible and this is one of the reasons that it is uh, uh, posing a number of problems. Now that's good news for communication engineers because that means uh, there's uh, work to do. When we interact with the internet we usually use names more than addresses, so names are human readable synonyms for addresses, originally. For example, 
uh, a name like ssc.upfl.ch is the IP address, is an equivalent, in some sense, of the IP address of the web server for SSC. We will discuss names in detail a bit later, but you can see immediately that names are structured. They have, for example, uh, they start from the more specific to the more general. Uh, the two-letter acronyms mean countries, so NZ New Zealand, CH Switzerland, CO Colombia, etc. They are sometimes uh, used uh, with a different meaning, but they are they mean country. The three-letter uh, acronyms mean the, the original uh, country-independent domains, like the most famous is .com. The internet was originally a non-for-profit network, so there was .com, .net, the network, .org for the non-profit organization. Of course, today most of the internet is for profit, and uh, so the dot com is the most popular one. And then uh, human creativity and greed is such that uh, we have invented names that we can sell, so you can buy more complex name like IRO, which means you get this name only if you work in the aeronautics sector. There's even the name dot Swiss, which you get, which is much more expensive to get than a name dot CH, uh, which is just ways to make money out of nothing, out of names. Uh, we'll come back to names a bit later. Right now, one important thing to realize is what happens, where are the names? So for example, if I click on ssc.epfl.ch in a document, the document is in my uh, local system, in my computer. When I click on it, what happens? Well, my computer is not able to send IP packets to the web server by using the name. It's the first important thing to remember. Routers don't see names. They see only addresses, IP addresses. So if I want to connect to this web server, I need first to do what is called a mapping. Mapping means I need to find what's the IP address that is behind this name using what is called the DNS, Domain Name System, which is perhaps the most important infrastructure of the internet today. EPFL has, for example, one DNS server that responds to the address .15.8. This one has to know what is the IP address of at least one name server, otherwise it's lost, so it's part of the configuration of this machine. So when I click in my browser to rwpol.com or to this, my computer will go to the DNS server and ask what is the IP address that corresponds to that name. It will get the IP address here. Here I'm showing a packet that has two things. Here it has a header, which is the IP header. That's the IP address of the packet. It's like the address when you send a postcard. And this is the text that's contained in the packet. So you see that the IP destination address of this first packet is that of the DNS server. The IP destination address of this message is my machine here. The IP address of the web server is in the text here. So this is the IP address of this server. Now, my browser now knows what is the IP address. It can open a TCP connection, transfer data, and send a GET information that will be responded back to me here. This is how I know the IP address of this web server. This is called a mapping uh, function. It's the same as for the postal service. In North America, for example, if you want to send something by post, which is a rare event, but happens, you need to find the zip code of, the, uh, of this, and the zip code are geographical, and there's no way to find the zip code by looking up uh, a service. So usually you call people, you send them an email to ask what is their zip code. In the internet, we're a bit better. We have a directory service here. How does the web server know the IP address of my machine? Yes? It's in the header. It's the return address. Of course, when this machine sends a packet to this guy, there is the destination address that's used by all the routers to know when to send the packet, but there's also the source address, which will therefore be learned by the servers. So servers don't need to look up the, the DNS to know where to send the answers, of course. Voila, that was a very crash a course type of overview of the network layer, but of course we'll go into more depth in the coming 
hours. Another networking layer is called the MAC layer, in the green box below. So the goal of the green box is to interconnect all the systems in the world. The network layer does it by having intermediate systems that do packet switching and using those addresses. Now, something that is perhaps the most, the, the less well understood in the internet is the MAC layer. And in fact, some people make the theory that we could build in an ideal world an internet that has no MAC layer. So that gives uh, you already an idea of why things are a bit complex. Perhaps uh, there is some overlap. To make things simple, we can think of the MAC layer as a mechanism to connect systems together locally, at home, for example. At home, if you have an ADSL modem or a, what we can call a hub or switch, and you want to connect using Ethernet cable, a printer, a computer, and a network access uh, a file server, for example. That is a classical use of the MAC layer. Another more interesting one is if you want to connect via radio waves, so Wi-Fi is the prototype of this, then it is functionally the same. You put a base station and all the equipment is able to speak to the base station and to the equipment connected to the base station. So it is a mechanism to do local connection. Historically, it is to do cabling. So the how do you, in order to build a network, you need at the lower level a way to connect neighboring systems together. I mean, a store and forward or a packet forwarding device needs to be connected to the next packet forwarding device. How do I connect one machine to the next? I need some physical uh, medium. The physical medium, together with a few other things, are called the MAC layer. And the first acronym to learn is local area network. A local area network is a set of devices that are connected on the same hub or switch or to the same base station. We'll see it's a bit more complicated, but I will not dwell into those details now. In the case of Wi-Fi, there is some real interest in doing that. It is to avoid collisions. If I have a base station that I want to access over a wireless medium, several can, I want to be able to connect several together. Now, if they all talk together, the base station will see collisions, so we need a way to handle that. That's the main function of the MAC layer. Then it's easy to understand why we have a MAC layer. Here, in the case of Ethernet, there is no such thing, or there is not any more such thing, as we will discuss later. So it's a bit more mysterious why we have Ethernet here, but for the time being, let's accept that there is. Ethernet uses MAC addresses. MAC addresses are hardware addresses. So if, for example, this, those four machines are connected to the same Ethernet switch, when they communicate, they will communicate using uh, the switch here. And by putting in what is called uh, a MAC layer packet or an Ethernet frame, they will put a destination address, which is uh, the address, for example, here of the Ethernet interface of the router, exactly like we do between routers. So you could say, well, this is duplicating routers, and it is, in fact. Now, it's easy to understand if it is Wi-Fi. If you're using Wi-Fi to communicate in ad hoc mode, for example, without a base station, you can imagine that you broadcast in the air a packet, and then in order to know who can read the packet, you need to put some indication for whom this packet is intended. For whom this packet is intended is called the MAC address. The first difference between a MAC address and an IP address is that the MAC address is a hardware address. It's a serial number, like if you have a bicycle, perhaps on the frame somewhere there is a number. It's the number of the frame and it's made in China, so it's a number done by the company who made it in China. So it's the same for MAC addresses. They're usually made in China as well. So all MAC addresses here do not identify where the system is in the world, whether this router is in Switzerland or in China. Uh, there will be no difference. It always has the same MAC address. The MAC address is the address of the hardware. So if you have an Ethernet adapter, it's the address of your Ethernet adapter. Wherever you are in the world, you keep the same address. Typically, the mental model of a MAC layer is that one. 
all stations within the local area have the capability to receive all the packets and in principle only the ones that have the corresponding destination MAC address are supposed to copy it, to receive it. Of course, this is only in theory, in practice, you can have a packet sniffer and we will learn in the labs how to use packet sniffers. You, if you run a packet sniffer here, you will be able to see uh, the traffic that is here. That's one of the security problems of the MAC layer that we will discuss a bit later. I mentioned the acronym Local Area Network. For us now, our formal definition is a set of devices that can communicate at the MAC layer. It looks like a tautological definition, but it means that a set of devices that can communicate with each other knowing only their MAC addresses, not knowing their IP addresses, for example. Why is that? We will cover uh, a bit later. But to be able to move on quickly, let's mention this fact. Typically, you interconnect local area networks with routers. That's the classical organization of the Internet. This is why the Internet is called the Internet and not the Net. Inter means to interconnect several networks. So at the origin, the networks were the MAC layer stuff a Wi-Fi base station with equipment around it. This is one network. And when the internet was done, at the time I was a student, when there was one computer in my university, of course you had to interconnect one computer with another one in a remote university. So the networks were small. They were uh, networks like this one. And the goal of the internet was to interconnect various campuses that had their own local area network. So typically, and this is visible today, we have typically, when you connect with a wired system, you connect to a box that has different names. It can be called a hub, a switch, a uh, concentrator. In most cases, it has what we call the function of an intermediate system of the MAC layer. That means it's able to receive packets, analyze their MAC addresses, and send them to the corresponding destination, perhaps to the printer here. And then, Systems like this are interconnected by routers. So if you want to communicate from this, if you want to send something to that printer, you will need to send via the router, which means you will need to know the IP address of the printer. In practice, you need to know all IP addresses, but in theory, communication without a LAN could exist without IP addresses. Here is another mode of interaction of local area networks and the IP layer. That's the concept of network mask. <coughs> All machines that are in the same local area network, because IP is an inter-networking thing, if two machines are in the same local area networks, the IP layer should not be involved in the communication. So we don't need to go through a router to communicate two machines that are on the same base station, for example. Here, this is shown on this example, this is one local area network of EPFL. Uh, this machine and that machine, when they communicate together, they can go directly through their Ethernet switch. They should not go via the router. How do they know that this should happen? The question is valid because communication today is always, except for a few exotic protocols that we will discuss in one or two slides, is always via the IP layer. So even if two systems are in the same local area network, they will still use IP and TCP and everything. And why do we do that? Because we don't want to have to code an application or an operating system differently depending on whether your printer is on the same local area network or not. If the printer is in the same room here or a few offices downstream, it should not make, have to make a difference. So in practice, everything is coded as if the remote party can be anywhere in the world, not just on the same local area network. However, when this machine sends a packet to that one, it has to know, it has to send it to this one and not to the router. Concretely, that means it has to know what is the MAC address of this guy, but when this guy is sending to STI Sun 1, it has to send it to the router via Ethernet. That means it needs to send it to the MAC address of the router. So this guy needs to know somehow whether the destination is in the same local area network or not. And the bad thing is there is no pre-programmed way to know the 
ideology, the, the dogma of the internet is you sh that should be visible in the addresses. You see here, for example, all those machines have the same prefix, 128, 178, 71. So all these block of three words, namely 3 times 8, 24 bits, the first 24 bits of all of those addresses are the same. In contrast, the machine that is here uh, doesn't have the same block of 24 bit, the same so-called network prefix. So all machines in the same LAN must know uh, two machines, sorry, when they want to communicate, must know whether they are in the same LAN or not. They must know what is their network part, which is, for example, 128.178.71. If you configure a machine, you give it its address, and in order to know what is the network part, uh, the bad news is you need to know which length of the prefix corresponds to the network part. You could say, well, it's always 24. Yes, but things would be too simple. For example, at ETH in Zurich, it's 26. So it's the first 26 bits that correspond to the network part. At EPFL, like in most places, it's 24. So there is no rule, you need to code it. So you can code in this way. You say, here is my address, slash 24. That's a commonly used method to encode this, and it means the prefix is 24. So if I have another machine that has 128, 178, 72 dot something, I analyze the first 34 bit, I will find it's not the same string, that guy is not in the same subnet as me, I should not send directly to this guy, but use a router instead. For historical reasons, this is using a more sophisticated and cumbersome way that's called a mask. Instead of saying 24, you give a string of bits, 0 and 1, which says the ones corresponds to the, Porsche, the place that is the network prefix. Of course, you can give the same information as here. It's more complicated. And then, of course, you code this in decimal because we don't code usually IP uh, v4 addresses in binary. So, for example, if you're at EPFL, this is 24 bits, 24 times 1, followed by 8 times 0. When you code this in decimal, you code by block of 8. And this block of 8 bits is, if you take a digital calculator, if you take the calculator on your uh, PC or uh, Mac, and you translate this, which is binary, to decimal, you will obtain 255. That's something to remember. If you don't know it yet, you will have to remember it. Which means this prefix, is, this way of recognizing is called the mask. The mask at EPFL is 255, 255.255.0. .255 that is a cumbersome way to say 24 bits. Why did people do that? Uh, I can't see any good reason. I don't know for sure, but the only good reason I could see is that the prefix could be anywhere. When you give a mask, the ones could be anyone. So it could be, for example, that the network prefix is those four bits only. You would put zero every one, one here. So that flexibility exists. But I've never, never seen any system using that flexibility. So today the masks are simply number of bits. So you will need to know that to do uh, lab one. That's why we mention it in so much detail now. So this is the network and the Mac layer that have the goal of interconnecting systems. Of course, at the end of the day, even if you put the cable and you interconnect the systems today, you need to transform the bits that are inventions of human being that exists only in cyberspace into physical things, because we need to even to move information. We need some physical stuff. Most communication systems use electromagnetic waves of various kinds, radio waves for Wi-Fi, uh, light waves for optical fibers, radio waves that are in cable for Ethernet that is on copper and not on, on fiber. And uh, it's the goal of the physical layer to say, how do I encode a bit or a block of bits into a signal that will be decoded by the other end? We will not see in detail how this is done, of course. This is uh, the goal of the course called Principle of Digital Communication. How do you achieve this thing here? There are, of course, very primitive ways. You could code, encode, for example, a zero by a certain sign 
function and uh, one by the same but inverted in sign, minus this one. Uh, those are very primitive ways and uh, communication theory will tell you that there are much better ways here. A few systems use other forms of waves, for example, underwater uh, electromagnetic waves do not propagate because wa water, in particular salt water, is a conducting, uh, is a conducting material. So uh, submarines and things like this use uh, acoustic waves, they use the sound waves. So we can use the sound to send information, but as we will see, uh, this has some performance impact. We will always mention bit rates, so what is that exactly? Bit rate is called by practically everybody except a few people, those who took a course in digital communication, they call it bandwidth. So bandwidth in the context of TCP IP networking means bit rate, which is a completely uh, colliding term. Bandwidth in science means uh, you take the Fourier transform of a signal, you look in the frequency space, and if that lives uh, in a certain space of frequencies, the width of the space in which it lives is called the bandwidth. That's something that has to do with Fourier transform. Of course, in, we don't like Fourier transform very much. It's very complicated, very cumbersome. So uh, we ignore that. And in invariably all documents you will read, bandwidth means the bit rates. How many bits per second a physical cable can send, for example. How many bits per second can Wi-Fi send? Depending on the, ver the version of Wi-Fi, you can send, for example, at 45 megabit per second. This 45 megabit per second is sometimes called the bandwidth. But don't talk to Bixio Rimoldi or Emre Telatar in those terms. They would not like it. But if you read documents from Cisco or from others, they will use that word. So we'll have to live with this ambiguous terminology. I'll try to avoid it uh, when possible, but not always. The bit rate of a channel, a physical channel, a wire, for example, that connects two machines, is how many bits per second you can send. In the old days, it was a few kilobits per second. Now we go to gigabits per second. Typically, giga, mega, etc., when it comes for bits, are the powers of 10. When it comes for bytes, they are powers of 2. Uh, small difference. Of course, there are physical limits that are given by nature. For example, the, there is the well-known Shannon Hartley law for additive white noise Gaussian channels that says that if I have a channel on which there is uh, a given bandwidth B, now the bandwidth is in Hertz, over which I have a given signal to noise ratio, so this is the uh, the ratio of the powers of the signal, the one you intend to transmit, and the noise. The noise exists because we don't live at absolute zero uh, degrees, so there is a agitation of all electrons that create noise. And if you know the ratio, you have the max possible capacity. You cannot transmit more than that. For example, on very, very long telephone cables, you cannot send more than a few tens of kilobits per second. On shorter cables, you can go to meg megabits per second or even tens of megabits per second. This is why if you live very far in the center of France, 30 kilometers away from the next central office, perhaps you are over ADSL, you will not get 10 megabit per second. That's because of the physical limitation of the cable. Of course, you can overcome the physical limitation of the cable by putting electronic equipment, by breaking the cable into smaller pieces. But there are physical limitations. Same for wireless technology. There's a physical limit to what you can send over a given bandwidth. You can increase the bitrate by increasing the bandwidth. For cable, it's usually difficult because there are physical properties of the copper system, the telegraph equations that dictate uh, what bandwidth is feasible. Over wireless channels, it depends what part of bandwidth has been allocated to a given six system. A small mathematical question. The transmission time is usually called as the time it takes to transmit a certain number of bits. Right. Assume I have one megabyte to send at 10 kilobit per second. How much transmission time does it take? So transmission time is the time to modulate on the physical cable all the signals I need to transmit this.
So compared to what you did in physics in your first bachelor year, it's a very easy exercise. So I move on quickly. I close the poll in five seconds. And the majority vote is, is lost. So let me try again. We're all in the same local area network, so we could, with somebody volunteering to the job of coding a polling application that gets all the polls from the local area, we will save a lot in performance and we will not need to pay anything to turning point technologies. So, second attempt to close the poll. I close the poll now. And the majority has the right answer. Uh, the transmission time is the number of bits in, divided by the bits per second. That gives second. And here it gives 800 seconds. OK, that's trivial. Something a bit less trivial is the difference between transmission and propagation. If that's the first time you see it, it's important to remember. Propagation. Transmission time is, so I'm showing again a time-space axis, but in order to exercise your mental agility, now it's transposed. The horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is space. A is sending some data to B using, for example, this uh, very simplistic uh, signaling. That's the one that's used on Ethernet at 10 megabit per second, for example. The bits per second are given by the size of those signals, so one symbol, this is one symbol, this is another one, so depending on whether you have a falling transition or a rising transition, you have a zero or a one. This is called Manchester encoding, it's in a, a very old systems use that, it's very simple. So the time for, that is taken for one symbol gives, so is, here is one bit, if you want to take 10 megabit per second, that means you have a certain budget of time, uh, which is here, 100 nanosecond for, uh, for this thing here. This is what gives the bit rate. But now when A sends to B, the signal propagates at a certain speed, which is, if we're using electromagnetic waves, it is the speed of light, which is the same for all electromagnetic waves which is 300,000 kilometers per second in empty space or in the air, uh, a bit less when you're in uh, solid material like in optical fiber or in copper. It's uh, perhaps two-thirds of this. So it takes some time. So when the first bit is sent, it takes some time. That time is called the propagation time. The propagation time is therefore the time it takes for the beginning of the first bit to move on. This is given by nature, it's not given by technology. The bit rates are given by technology. Every year we have more bit rates. We are now in the hundreds of gigabits per second. When everybody watches YouTube in high definition, then we will have uh, even more uh, on optical fiber uh, gigabits per second. Or if you want to do distributed gaming. You... So that's given by technology. If you invest more, you will get more gigabits per second. Here, technology won't help. This is given by God or the law of nature or whoever made that world, and it's uh, the speed of light here. If you use an acoustic channel, it is the speed of sound. And for example, you can do the computation. If you do a 1,000 kilometer of an acoustic channel, the propagation time is order of one hour. So you see the interest of using electromagnetic uh, channels rather than acoustic channel. The this time, of course, is very short, but it's not negligible. It's five microseconds per kilometer. 
now there are many kilometers of cables and signals go very fast. And when we do gigabits per second, in one gigabit there's many, many bits. So the first bit takes a significant time. What is, for example, the time it takes to go around the Earth? You send a ping to New Zealand and the machine in New Zealand returns back to you. New Zealand is exactly at the opposite of the Earth from here. So when we do that, was the time for the propagation, not for sending all the bits that are in the ping, but just the time for the first bit to go there and come back. Again, a simple uh, proportionality computation. So I close the poll now. When I do it too fast, it doesn't work. So I don't close the poll now. I wait a bit more. So this system is controlling me. It's exercising flow control on me. If I try to stop the channel before all the data that is in the channel has arrived, it crashes. We will see that this is a function of TCP, of the transport layer, to flow control the other, the, the destination. I try to close again. And now Dirac on the correct answer, which is 200 milliseconds. That's the time it takes for the light to propagate in copper around the Earth, approximately, in round numbers. Now, is it big or small? Well, it's one fifth of a second. But of course, that's just the propagation time. You will have to add to that the processing time, the transmission time which means that if you do distributed gaming with New Zealand, it will not be the same as if you do it with somebody that's in the next room. A fraction of a second is something visible. When you talk, 200 milliseconds is visible. That means when I, when I talk to someone, and if there is a f significant fraction of a second, it provokes uh, uh, what is called half-duplex communication. I speak, then I need to wait a bit, then the other guy uh, responds. If you use satellite links, the satellites are far, far uh, in, in the, uh, above the Earth, uh, then the propagation times are even larger. Now, if we combine all of this and we see what is the time it, sends to, it takes to send one kilobyte, I've here depicted four different scenarios, one that I can call uh, a GSM scenario. You're sending over a cellular network of poor quality. You're sending a file, for example, in a country where the internet is blocked. The only way you have is a, with a modem over your GSM link. Uh, then we see that the time to send is 800 milliseconds and the propagation is 0, 01. Therefore, the transmission is a dominating. You can ignore propagation. Here, we have a long distance and 1 megabit per second. This is what we have in the best case when we're downloading things from New Zealand or from a remote part of the world. One megabit per second is good to get so much throughput from the other side of the world. But we see that here the propagation time is dominating. It takes more time for the signal to propagate than it takes to send. So one K byte is approximately one IP packet. So the transmitting to the other side of the globe is dominated by the propagation time. Of course, if you're in the local area, the propagation time are very small, whatever the bit rate, and in that case, uh, the dominating thing is the transmission time. 
Well, I think I will stop here for today. We will uh, continue tomorrow in the lab and uh,